I want to know if any of us are actually wearing like pants. I am wearing pants. I'm wearing pants. I don't know because I went to the grocery store this morning. (laughs) (laughs) I put on earrings. That was the effort that I I was like, I'm going to put some earrings on us. I styled my hair. That's the extent. (laughs) I was like, I don't feel like putting any makeup on. Some things are just a step too far. Like pants. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like there's gonna be this reckoning and like and when this is all over and I find out there. Okay, we're okay, live now. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, so are we gonna start talking about tropes? Yeah. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone. Um I am Bess Hamilton. I'm your moderator today. I'll be guiding this fun group. And today we're talking oh the tropes. So if I could have each of the writers introduce themselves to our lovely viewers and we'll get started. All right, Um, who's going first? You are. Oh, me? Okay, I'm I'm Eve Vaughn. Let me know when it's my turn. I'm Eve Vaughn and uh, I am in the US uh, outside of Philly. I write um, paranormal, sci-fi, I write a lot of alpha holes, so that's kind of my my thing. Um, what else do I write? Paranormal, sci-fi, contemporary. Uh, I do just about everything except historical. Excellent. Okay, take somebody to introduce themselves. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm Molly. Uh, I'm Molly O'Keefe. I'm M. O'Keefe for the for the dirtier stuff, and I'm Molly Fader uh, in women's fiction and sort of like family saga mysteries. Um, and then I also, as Molly O'Keefe, write historical Westerns. So yeah, oh, a lot of, I cover a lot of ground. And in terms of like tropes, like my favorite tropes to write are uh, like revenge. Like mm. I'm going to make you fall in love with me and get revenge. I like that one. I love forced proximity, enemies to lover, and any marriage of convenience. Those are my... Like, I'm like, I'm not going to write in uh, enemies to lovers. Damn it, I'm writing in enemies. <laughs> Hi, I'm Desiree Holt, and I write romantic suspense as well as contemporary romance. My favorite tropes to write are best friend's sister, boss's daughter, friends to lover, and secret billionaire. Um, one of my favorite books that I wrote is Best Friend's Sister, and that was book one in my Game On series called Full of Hell. So I had a lot of fun doing that, and it dealt with football, which I am a football junkie, so could life be better. <laughs> All right, All right. I'm, I'm going to okay. go. Go. Okay. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Lister, and I write uh, gay erotic romance, usually kinky. Uh, Well, always kinky. It depends on the level. But uh, uh, anyway, I don't, you know what? I don't write a lot of tropes, or not intentionally, uh, but I read a lot of them. And uh, my favorite is Enemies to Lovers. Uh, And I did write, actually, a short story called Power Tool uh, this past year that is an Enemies to Lovers, and it was a lot of fun to write. Wait, wait, wait. What was the title again? Power, uh, tool. power tool. Yeah, power tool. Like, what was the tool? I'm it's trying about to. A, <laughs> it's about a guy who uh, lives besides their neighbors, and the one guy likes to renovate and use his power tools very early in the morning. And of course, there's a little double entendre there, of course. But uh, uh-huh. yeah. Nice. So that. Was, <laughs> but I have to say, my favorite author of Enemies to Lovers is Misha Horn. Uh, in the mail. Oh, yeah. Anyway, oh my God, yeah, she is the queen of Enemies to Lovers. And that's for sure. So I think it's my turn. Uh, I'm Jen Burke. I write uh, paranormal, sci-fi, um, have not dipped my toes into contemporary yet. I'm mostly in the paranormal world. Um, I write MM um, with my my most recent series is with Karina Press. Um, not dead yet. Here. Um, and my favorite tropes... Um, I, I'm going to say uh, Second Chance um, because I ended up writing two series about Second Chance Romance and I didn't really intend to write two series with Second Chance Romance, but um, that's how it turned out. Other uh, favorite tropes of mine are the amnesia trope. 
Um, when it's done well, that can be really fun. Um, and what else? Uh, friends to lovers is always a good one too. Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, I'm Zoe York. I also write as Ainsley Booth. Um, I write contemporary romance. Um, and like as Zoe, I write like hot contemporary romance. And as Ainsley, I write like really nice erotic romance. So like they're, the kind of heat levels are the same, but there's a couple of differences. Um, I think that I write more tropes as Zoe. I don't know. We'll talk. And every so often I write a sci-fi romance and those are like trope heavy, like as many tropes as I can cram into each book. What are your favorites though? My favorite tropes? Uh, uh, definitely marriage and trouble. And <laughs> because every time tropes get talked about, I have to admit that I have started like four series with a marriage and trouble book and marriage and trouble is a pretty niche trope. <laughs> And yet it's always what I like make my like loss leader always every single time. So I'm in, I'm like a, I, I need like a trope recovery group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think uh, Judith, you're the only one who hasn't introduced themselves yet. No, nope, I think she's no, Desiree. Oh, but she has. Is that everyone? Great. So yeah. for um, people who are watching who don't know exactly what a trope is, it's um, a commonly recurring theme. Um, some people might say cliche, but I don't think that's fair in creative works. Um, so if you think about, you know, like Pretty Woman, the trope of the makeover, the rags to riches, the Cinderella story. Um, and that is what we're here to talk about today. So some of you already talked about like what your favorite romance trope is. Is there one that you haven't tried yet that you want to? I have not tried the amnesia trope yet. And I'd really like to do that because I think that would cross over really well into my romantic suspense. So I'm kind of making notes about what I need right now. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't done it. Asia either and it's like as like an old school harlequin like those that's how i cut my teeth reading yeah like, you know everybody had <laughs> i just and I, I i just can't quite figure out how to i guess make it work and i've also never done the brothers like in love with the best friend's sister or brother that kind of thing which i also would like to try but haven't yet so I'm literally, I just started reading Brenda Jackson's Forget Me Not, which is an amnesia book. And yeah. it's my, like, it's one of my favorite tropes to read, and I've never written it either. Do you think I did it's an challenging? Amnesia trope book. I, I did an amnesia trope book, and I have to tell you, if you're going to tackle it, it's harder than you think it is, because keeping track of who knows what and... Oh, I, yeah, I would think it would be really difficult. It was, and I wrote it from the point of view of the character with amnesia. Right. So, yeah, so that was, um, that, that was a tough book to write. It went through a lot of rewrites because, yeah. you know, trying to keep the tension up and, and um, keep track of who knows what. And, oh, of course, you know, he knows this, but maybe he does. Anyway, it was, it was, it was pretty tough, but it was a lot of fun. Mm, I think one of the tropes I like to try is famous person falls in love with a normal person. I love reading those, but I haven't done one of those yet. I always like that, but I, it's always, when I've read them, it's always the guy who's the famous person, but I want it to be the woman to be the famous person, because I think there's going to be a lot of dynamics that you can explore with that. Maybe like the guy not being comfortable having like a, a recognizable partner and somebody who makes a lot more money than him. So there's always those dynamics to tackle. And those are pretty fun to read, I think. Um, when there's a, there's my dog barking in the background. <laughs> so, um, Louie, what are you doing? Um, a trope that I haven't tackled that I would like to at some point is rags to riches. Um, I love those types of stories, you know, where somebody's kind of, yeah, you know, hits rock bottom and then comes back up into you know um their life kind of turns around that's that's yeah that's they're a lot good. of fun to read i'd like to to write one of those for sure i like the, uh, 
Sorry. Canadians who've all been. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I, I just was going to say I like I really like the forced proximity trope. I like to read it. Uh, have never written it, but I don't think. Um, but uh, yeah, that would be one that I would like to maybe do a short story. Oh, I, I mean, a lot of ideas with the quarantine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just finished the uh, the Shit Creek. I don't oh, know if you all watched the series, but I just, oh, I love I just finished it, and I'm like, I was planning this next series, and I was like revamping it all to be riches to rags to riches again because <laughs> it's such a good. I mean, it was such a good arc on that show that I wanted oh, for to, sure. I'm gonna totally steal. Sorry, <laughs> that's a great show. So I have a, a reader question. What tropes actually make you upset or that you wish people wouldn't use? And that's a question that's open to all of you. Hmm. Well, for me, I like, I mean, I, I, I write a lot of my women are of color. A lot of, I write a lot of interracial books, but um, I don't really focus on race. I, I don't like when books are focused on their conflict as a race. I'm in an interracial relationship myself. I've been with my husband for almost 20 years. And I mean, we have regular problems just like everybody else. I want to read about a couple like us that are going through problems like everybody else. And it's the same when I, I, I like male male romance as well. And I don't like it when the problem is I'm gay and what am I going to do? I, I want yeah. to see gay men, gay women having the same problems as regular couples. So I don't like... The trope said, I am othered for some reason. So this is what the conflict is. I want these people, these these interracial couples, these gay couples, um, these trans couples having the same problems that everybody else has. For sure, for sure. And you can you can do that and you can still incorporate a little bit every once in a while, a little bit of a situation uh, when, say, when a gay couple is out at a restaurant and they want to kiss each other, but they're a little too nervous. You can right. incorporate those little right. bits. To exactly. Get realism, yeah, I mean, you can't erase their identities. The you can't erase their identities. But if that's the only focus, right. then that's like yeah. boring. It's boring. Yeah, it's no, lazy exactly. writing. And that's just my opinion, though. I mean, some people like it. I agree. Uh, I know one that's really sensitive, and I've become more aware of it in the last little bit, is the whole um, secret baby or accidental pregnancy, um, that kind of trope. I know that that's really difficult for a lot of women who have um, infertility issues. So that's one that I would probably stay away from, um, uh, just because, you know, I'm, I've had friends who have struggled with infertility. So it's it's not something that I would really want to exploit as a, a trope or a plot in a book. For sure. But I yeah. mean, there's, there's a lot of tropes out there. And so this is just our opinion of what we wouldn't want mm -hmm. to read. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I feel like, you know what, there's always going to be tropes that are going to, I don't know, be troublesome for some people. And you, it's it, the nice thing about a book that is a trope is that it's pretty clear what the trope is. Because uh, oftentimes it's, you know, it's right in the blurb. This is an accidental pregnancy trope. So you can know to steer clear of it. But and one of the nice things about tropes and stories that are written to tropes is that it's very easy for the reader to read to understand, OK, this is a book I will probably mm -hmm. like or this is a book I will probably hate. Yeah, exactly. Right. I've never loved um, love triangles. Mm. Remember those early uh, what were they like? They were called Sunrise books and it was they were all historical fiction and it was a girl who fell in love with these two guys is it is it ringing bells for anybody yes yeah uh -huh. and i i read them like crazy and you know she always has to pick somebody and it was never the one i wanted <laughs> so was, I've, I've i've lost my love for love triangles and i i, I can't imagine writing one at this point i, I, I wrote one by accident honestly yeah. Um, because I write my books um, very off the cuff and in a linear fashion. And it ended up, the first book in my Beyond the Edge trilogy ended up being a love triangle book. But I don't categorize stuff in my head very much. So I didn't even realize it. And then some people bought it thinking it was a menage, which it, it is in a physical sense. But, but it's really a love triangle, which I resolved in the next book and then, then the following book and bringing the characters together. But but uh, I know people were a little bit, some some people were upset. I, I, I'm kind of that too. I, I've read more love triangles than I think I ever want to read again. And it's hard for me 
at this point, I don't have any interest in them. It's interesting um, because I just did a, a trope survey with my readers. Um, it started because I, I wrote a nonfiction writing book called Romance Your Brand. And in, in one of those chapters, I off the cuff say, um, you know, pick the, pick the most universal trope. That's what you should start. Take, like, learn from my experience of putting marriage in trouble books always at the start of a series. Don't do that. Pick a more universal trope. And um, a couple of writers said, well, what is the more, what are the more universal tropes? And I didn't want to just give my guess. So I set up a survey. And if any readers watching this want to take the survey, it's actually open until June. So you can go to thetropeproject.com. I set up a like, this is what I'm doing while in quarantine or self-isolation <laughs> is I've set up like websites, many websites. So <laughs> thetropeproject.com. And so far we've had more than 1,300 responses. And the most interesting thing to me is that literally every trope on the list, there's 25 of them, literally every single one has at least one vote for like my favorite and, and every single one has at least one vote for my least favorite. That being said, out of 13 responses, so only uh, nine people said that Love Triangle was their first, like their most favorite. <laughs> so I think that that speaks to the... Uh, I think that that speaks to the uh, the romance specific dislike of Love Triangle because I think that if YA readers took the thing quite different. Yeah, Love Triangles are hard. I mean, I tried to write one and it ended up being a menage. She just took them both at the end. <laughs> <laughs> She was like, I love you both and I'm not going to choose. And they were like, okay. <laughs> I with it. So I think one of the things that came up during this discussion is um, it can be really hard to keep a trope fresh because uh, yeah. it seems like you all think the romantic triangles played out. So how, when you are using a trope, what do you do to make sure you're keeping it fresh? Oh, boy. I think because I, I write the male male um, or gay romance, pretty much like all the tropes that I use are are fresh. You know that it's a new application for it. It's not um, it's, it's not quite the same as if I was writing uh, male female and and revisiting the tropes. There's always some element of hey, it's too like I wrote a unarranged marriage trope and it was between. Um, a uh, griffin shifter king and his um, arranged consort who are both male um so that you know instantly right there it's it's fresher than um you know some of the the arranged marriages that we've seen in male female because that is a much older kind of approach i mean that's as old as time right um so so i think there's there's that element of it for if you're writing um you know uh male male female female um anything like that some of those tropes um i've seen discussions online about how you know you can't really say any of these tropes are really old and and um not usable anymore because they haven't been applied to um more diverse characters um so it's it's that's something to keep in mind when you're when you're thinking about different tropes to use Oh, somebody's kidding. <laughs> my, my, my cat wants to be part of this. She thinks she's a co author and she is on my desk every day Aww. when I'm ready. She's Aww, a kitty. Three, and she loves watching me write. Awesome. Don't say hi to everybody, best. <laughs> My puppy yeah. will come up beside me and put his head on my computer <laughs> right yeah. on my keyboard. It's like, like time for a walk. Yeah. yeah. I I think a way to keep your tropes fresh too has to do with the characters because every yes. character and every story is different. That's so right. you might start with the same basic framework, but what makes the story is what you do with your characters. Absolutely. Yeah. When I Molly already brought up one really good way to, to make a trope fresh is to mash it up um, with either yeah. another trope or to, or to flip the trope, right? So it's not rags to riches, but rags to riches to, or ri riches to rags to riches again, 
Or another good one I saw on Twitter was um, not friends to lovers or enemies to lovers, but frenemies to lovers. Okay. You get you get the benefit, right. you get the benefits of both, right? The tension, but they secretly like each other. But the tension, but they secretly like each other. I want to read all of the frenemies to lovers. <laughs> I feel like the anytime you're going to start a story with a with a trope in mind, I have to understand what the reader wants from that trope. Like, what are the scenes? What are the emotional hits? And the better I understand that. The, the better I can come at it sideways or come at it in a, in a different way than, than would be expected. Like if you think about the secret baby trope, you know, people are waiting for the scene when the, the person who doesn't know that they've had a baby finds out that they've had a baby. Well, how do you write that scene in a way that is, you know, respectful and fresh and different and exciting, right? But you, you don't know how to do it until you have to that kind of thing. So anytime I'm setting out to write a specific trope, I, I, I try to figure out what those emotional hits are. There's so much action. And this right now. If I could throw a book rack out there um, on the, so I least favorite trope. I don't think I answered that before. It is like, I don't want to read it. It's so desperately unfair to that child, etc. And yet one of my most favorite books ever is a secret baby book. Um, and it's a it's a Carolyn Crane book, which I have already forgotten the title of, but it's Thorne's book. I just call it Thorne's book. It's the third book in her Undercover Associates series. Into the Shadows, Out of the Shadows. Shadows is in And it's so perfect because it hits those beats exactly. Like there's a good reason why she didn't tell him sooner. And you wait the entire book to really figure that out. Um, we have a reader question here. Um, so we all talked about like tropes we want to see less of, or less of, but what are the ones that are sort of neglected that you would want to see more of? Hmm. I, I love like the arranged, arranged marriage in fantasy romance. Um, not so much in, in contemporary, but, but in fantasy romance or paranormal romance, I love the idea of the arranged marriage. You know, you have to smush these people together and then they need to figure out how to actually um, be in a relationship and be partners. That I, I love that. I don't see it enough. And I love it in contemporary. I agree with you. That's one, like the marriage of convenience and arranged marriage, when it's done well in contemporary, because it seems so like ridiculous, but when it's done well, I mean, you're just riveted. It's all the force proximity. It's, you know, you can shove enemies to lovers in there. Like you can do a lot of stuff. And yeah. I like that. I like the blackmail trope. I know I'm like a dark romance person. So I kind of like grimy dudes as a hero, but I like writing them. And because I like writing broken heroes and uh, I don't know, the blackmail trope. It's just me. I'm a weirdo, maybe. But it's so like the hero is blackmailing the heroine to like be in a relationship. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Or to be that. with me, or else I'm going to do something. I'm, I'm actually writing one right now, and I don't know. Well, not really so much blackmail, so more so than I have something you want, and if you want it, you got to give me some booty. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a caveat for everybody. Uh, I, so, so don't ever write a trope that you don't really like or don't want to write. Right. Um, okay, so this happened to me. It was a Goodreads uh, free story event, and there were a few prompts left over, and I had neglected to join earlier, so I thought, okay, I'll just grab one of these leftover uh, prompts, and I can do it, you know, and, and I did it, and it was a gay for me, gay for you trope, okay, which I don't particularly like. But I thought, you know, I can do it. I can pull it off. And I did try to fit in that, you know, that guy was actually bi, not, not, he didn't just turn gay, you know, but I, I, it was not easy to write and I'm still not really happy with the story. So yeah, I mean, that should be obvious. Yeah. <laughs> don't write it. It kind of sounds like a Joe Exotic kind of thing. Gay for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I really like the broken hero trope. I write a lot of those. It's just. I, I don't know why it fascinates me so much, but I just like having the broken hero and having the heroine, without being so obnoxious about it, help him to find his foothold in life again, you know? Mm -hmm. I love those. 
This will surprise nobody uh, who's watched this so far, but I want more marriage and trouble books. If it <laughs> You'll probably have lots of inspiration after this quarantine. <laughs> uh oh. Somebody's dog. <laughs> Not mine. No, mine is actually quiet. Well, he's snoring. <laughs> Somewhere in the house. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we live out in the country, so things don't go by very often, and every now and then they do, and the dogs freak out. Um, a question from one of our readers, viewers online is, and this is a little bit away from tropes, but um, when you get a negative critique from a reader, how does that make you feel? Sad. I, I've had so many, it doesn't bother me anymore. I just, yeah. kinda, you know, I, w what I do, if, if one really does bother me, I think, uh, I think back to where there's uh, works of great literature on Goodreads that get one star reviews. So it doesn't bother me that much. What I'm trying to keep in mind is everybody comes to a story with their own, um, perceptions and their own baggage and their own exactly. history and what they see out of a story that I've written um you know they may be seeing things that I would never have perceived because I don't have the same background that they do That's and right. whatever you know it's it's valid if I, I remember getting um there was a it was a one or two star review on um the third book in the chaos station series that I co-wrote with Julie Jensen and this particular reader was livid that people did not give one of the characters more support, even though he was pretty much tearing his life apart because he was not reacting well to stuff that had happened in the first two books. Um, and he thought that, or the, the reader thought that everybody should kind of support him more and give him more love and just let him do what he needed to do and all this. And I kind of looked at it and I said, okay, you really love that character. And I'm, I'm really happy that you love that character so much. You think everybody else is mistreating him, um, but that's your opinion, and that's not the book. So, but yeah, it's basically you. You have to understand that not everybody um, reads the same book the same way, and right. everybody has different perceptions. And um, it's not a commentary on you as the author, but on the words that you put on the page. For sure, for sure. And, and it's the reader's interpretation of the book. You yeah. know, it, it's just. How you look at your characters is one thing, but how they look at them when you're reading them is a totally different thing. I have read books that I thought were just fabulous, and I'll tell somebody else about them, and somebody will say, "Oh, I read that book, and I thought it was terrible. Why did you?" Oh, exactly. That? And 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 it's just I think you find that with everything. <laughs> yeah. It's very subjective. It is very subjective. It's all how you look at it, but if you could get like a hundred great reviews and then you get that one negative review and it just sits with you for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, true. After a while, like I, 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 I don't mind negative reviews. I don't really read my reviews as much as I used to anymore. I feel like yeah. as long as they don't get personal, I'm okay. And I've had reviews where they've gotten personal, like even commented on my looks. So mm -hmm. yeah. So See, you know, that's not acceptable at all. Ever. Um, but, but people will I do it. Like as long yeah, as it's not personal, it. I, you know what? That's their opinion. Thank you for buying my book. <laughs> Actually, I get a lot of amusement out of the ones, uh, some of some of mine on Goodreads, where they hate the book so much, but they spend uh, like I don't know how long finding gifs and images to put in their bad review, and I'm just like, okay, why do you waste your time? <laughs> like, and then they go buy it. the next one to do the same thing. It. Exactly. Go buy something else. Right. So to bring it back to um, tropes, do you think it's actually possible to write a book without any tropes at all? Probably not. Mm -mm. There's Every always trope if you stop to think about it. Yeah. I mean, my books have a lot of, uh, or some of them have her comfort. Uh, one I'm writing right now is, I don't know, Reluctant Dom, I think is a trope. Um, so there's, uh, there's always little, you know, story aspects that have been done before. You're never going to write a completely original story. No. Yeah. I think that, that sometimes, I think that sometimes 
the, the trope of a story doesn't really drive the plot of the story. When a trope, like a, when I think of a book that's really like trope heavy, the trope is a plot motif. Right. It's, it's a it's a real theme in the book, right? Yeah. There are books that have like that that glance against tropes because tropes are the shorthand of how we think about life. But if a story is kind of low conflict, if it's like a high concept, high conflict book, then the, then the story tends to live, live more in the tropes. But if it's kind of low concept, low conflict, just like a warm, fuzzy read, often those don't those don't actually like live inside the tropes as much as kind of tropier books do, right? And sometimes that's like what that's when romance veers towards women's fiction or um, like upmarket contemporary fiction, like those, that, or the crossover with like mysteries and thrillers, they have tropes too, but not the same oh, yeah. way that romance. Once you start to have that kind of like cross genre stuff going on, then I think that we rely on tropes. Yeah, for sure. Have you borrowed, have any of you borrowed a trope from another genre and made use of it in romance? Hmm. I think that unreliable narrator. You know, like I keep, I keep like trying or wanting to play with it in romance, and I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't think it flies because you know, romance readers want so much from their point of view characters. But man, the unreliable narrator is a that's a good time. <laughs> I've I enjoy reading those. I don't know how I'd write a romance with one. Yeah, I mean, it would seem scary. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the uh, unreliable narrator as a reader, but as a writer, it's uh it could be a little bit tricky to to navigate. Um, do you have any questions about tropes for each other? Hmm. <laughs> I do, Zoe. So your your marriage and Jeopardy books, which I I I do love, I do love. But do you like? Do you, are you, do you ever get your pushback on it? Because it oh, is. I get like, oh, yeah. Like, there are people who are like, like, no, like, he's a douchebag. He has to go. And I haven't even written the worst one yet. That's coming out this fall. Um, like, people, no, absolutely. Like, there are lots of people who are like, one and done. I want my romance heroes to be perfect. Once the trust is broken, you can't get it back. Oh, absolutely. Like, tons of pushback. But the pushback is a little bit, I mean, that just warns other people what to expect. And it's also like a promise to people who are looking for that kind of story. Right. Have you, have any of you ever had like a, something from somebody who says that they want you to write something else, but you weren't comfortable writing it. They wanted you to write a, this trope or, you know, cause I sometimes have readers. It's like, could you write a story like this? I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> And not because I always I'm uncomfortable with it, but I like writing what I like to write, you know. I always turn that around and I encourage them to write that. Because I think what they're really deep down saying is, how do I write that? Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Sorry. Hmm. I never thought of that. <laughs> do you guys remember the book that you started, the romances that you started reading, like the first romance you started reading, do you remember what tropes those were that like, oh my God, Zoe, mine was a marriage in jeopardy. Wow. <laughs> like, do, you, like, do, you, do you remember what got you hooked about a certain trope when you were reading, when you were young? So mine was a Madeline Kerr book. Turns out later on, Madeline Kerr was like an old guy, which I don't know how I feel about going back to reread it. Um, but it was a it was a nanny. It was a nanny book. Um, oh wow! Was like, he he was like a businessman in Japan, and she was his like she didn't they didn't call her a nanny. What was she? The governess. She was a governess, and he was an he was an alpha hole. And emotionally unavailable, like did not talk to her the entire book. And then at the end, surprise, I love you this whole time. Mm. Oh, good times. <laughs> I'm going to read those Harlequin Presents books. You guys keep talking. I'm going to go find my Madeline Kerr book. I'll be back. Okay. Right. 
I, I like to read those Harlequin Presents books back in the day when, like, I'd take my mom's. I was, like, eight or nine years old. I didn't know what anything meant, but I was like, wow. But uh, I grew up, like, reading those <laughs> books. And, uh, yeah, sexy times. I'm like, uh, they're a lot steamier now than they used to be. But back then, to an eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid, I'm like, whoa. Um, but boss secretary books, those are, like... I grew up on those. I still love reading those. I don't know. Again, they have a special place in my heart. But like uh, the mousy secretary, a hot boss who dates like models and, and whatnot. And he's rich. And like she's like uh, his devoted servant, always there. And then one day she decides to get either a makeover or she decides to quit. And he can't live without her. I feel like that's why I like that uh, movie. It's like it was a two weeks notice. I love that movie. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm back. I think that's another trope that's tricky to do now. Like, it's so fraught with, you know, tension and, you know, power dynamics. That's one that, when done right, it's amazing, but, right. So, show and tell with Zoe. Okay, so here is my copy of Passions Far Shore by Madeline Kerr, which is a book that, I like I would not even read today. It's so problematic, absolutely problematic. Uh, but that's this is like my original Mills Boone version, and it looks on a place of honor. Passions for and shore, far. <laughs> the title. Oh, you know I used to read Mel and Care books. I didn't know that was a guy. Oh man. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, he wrote a lot of them. Yeah, he's like Australian, isn't he? A lot of them are in Australia. I, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, so good. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to read it. I don't want to ruin it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, getting back to um, the tropes that we grew up with, um, I don't know if I can think of any particular trope, but um, I grew up with those silhouette shadows, uh, paranormal categories. Um, I was in my early teens. I would basically raid the used bookstore and get as many as I could for a dollar each. And um, those were those were like my catnip for a really long time. Um, and I guess probably the, the biggest trope out of those was like the secret paranormal where, you know, the guy, the, the hero is a paranormal creature of some kind and the woman doesn't know and she's got to figure it out. Uh, her, and is her life in danger or is he a good guy? And we don't really know. Um, yeah, those were, those were great. I loved those. Yeah. So are there some tropes that are just so old fashioned now, like we were talking about the boss secretary. So the power dynamics have changed. Are there any other ones that you can think that used to be really popular when you were growing up or coming up as a, a writer that just can't be used anymore? Yeah. But make sure it can be done well, but it just feels old. Which one is that Molly? The nanny. The nanny you know. Oh yeah. Or the governor, governess yeah. Duke. You know, you see those in the old time historicals. Oh yeah, I love that. I still, I will still read those. <laughs> they work better for me in historical context. Like I think just now, it, I like the power dynamic is so, yeah, and it's really so heavily on like, you know, women being caregivers. <clears throat> Do you think swapping the gender in some of the older tropes would help? Totally, hundred oh, yeah. percent. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why writing uh, LGBTQ uh, fiction, it really appeals to me is because you could take some of these older ideas. I mean, there's a lot of it out now, but when it first started, you could, uh, it was a, very easy to make some of these older ideas fresh as some right. Of them before, right? So that can, you can take some of these really old fashioned tropes and, and do an LGBTQ story and it's, it's quite it's fresh. Different. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you can also throw a paranormal element in it a lot of times. Yeah. And sure. uh, that'll kind of work too. Because, you know, especially with like um like shifters and like they have a hierarchy and you can make it work that way. And it will kind of make a little bit more sense than say like a boss secretary relationship now. Yeah. Interesting. Um so when you're writing like your favorite trope because we did 
say at the top that you could consider tropes to be cliches. What do you try to avoid to keep it from straying too far into the the reader knowing like, okay, A, B, C, and Z are going to happen? Like, how do you keep it a little bit unpredictable and avoiding some of the the broader cliches? Um, for me, it has to do with, with the characters and, and how I create them and, and making them as different as I can because really the story evolves from the characters. And if I make them a little quirky or a little weird or a little whatever, then I can make the story fresh because I'm using the habits of the characters to do yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what comes first in a chicken and the egg scenario, the trope or the, the characters? Characters always come first for me. For me. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, except, well, except for Power Tool, which I did, uh, MLR Press put out a call for en enemies to lovers, and I thought, well, I can write that. But character is very important. I need those characters to start the story in any fiction. I really wish we had a drinking game, and every time you said Power Tool, we had to drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, here I got my uh, my bubbly. I can have a. I've been not that my wine because I have to ration it with my dog and my kid here. <laughs> I need it. I want her. <laughs> I, sometimes for me, the trope comes first. Like, so because I'm I'm self published. I'm indie published. Um, I I I play this game with myself called like, you know, does my acquisitions editor actually like this idea? So if I stick, if I, if I like let myself just be character driven, which is kind of my natural tendency to start with, like, I think of my characters as real people. They live in my head. Um, but I would write like 15 books about one family like that. I, if, if left unfettered, I would do that. And there would be no tropes. It would like be, just be like day in the life stories with like lots of finger banging so so it's a little bit of an like an editorial challenge to myself to be like okay but what are your tropes and if my characters don't don't have enough tropes then those characters need to go on the back burner like they're still real people i still honor them they still I promise them, like I lie to them, that they'll eventually get a story. Um, but I will, I will challenge myself to like go find a best friend's little sister idea, find new people. Yeah, I like I want to write a trope. I, as as I'm doing more indie publishing and just like, you know, the books that people are loving, I'm able to advertise the trope. So it like in an effort to be a better businesswoman, like, you know, Molly lean into that. And so I'll walk around and I'm doing it right now um, where I have this trope and I want to write this trope and I'm struggling to figure out the characters. And then some sort of alchemy will happen where the, the scene will like come to life in my head and I'll go, Oh, it's this, this kind of guy and this kind of gal. And it works in this trope. And I, like, I just had it happen where I was able to like, Think of remember the scene in Friday Night Lights where Riggins is saving the coach's daughter at that party, and then she kisses him. And I was like, "Oh, that's how we get," you know. Anyway, so um, I want to write the trope, but it gets nowhere until you get those characters figured out. And mm -hmm. usually, Riggins, so. characters usually come first for me all the time. But with my Taylor Vaughn books that I co-write with the author Theodora Taylor, um. The trope came first, which is hot alien abduction. We wanted to write hot alien alien abduction books. So we, you know, tried to come up. Well, we did come up with the concept. We had to do a lot of world building, how this came about. And, and um, like, why do these aliens need these women and, and what's going on in their world? And um, sometimes a trope does come first if you have an idea in mind that you want to. Right, like I think certain tropes have to come first, like alien abduction. Like we get characters for that. First. <laughs> yeah, like there's it's not just going to organically like, happen in the story. It's not. That's not just going to organically happen, really. <laughs> I, I feel like some tropes do just like dystopian tropes. Like that's something like you want to write a dystopian story. I feel like I, I guess the characters could come first in those, but like there are certain tropes that absolutely do come first. It just depends. 
alien abduction is one of them. So for me, it depends on the type of book that I'm writing. So when I was writing um, some uh, category paranormal romance for a publisher who shall not be named, um, I started with a trope for those because their category, they're smaller, they're, you know, 50,000 words, 50 to 60,000 words. So, and they're really trope driven. Mm -hmm. Um, With my books with Karina, the Not Dead Yet series, that's a little bit different because I started there with the concept of the characters. And instead of the concept of the, well, the concept of the story was there is it was a paranormal mystery, um, but the trope of the second chance romance and, and that kind of thing, that sort of grew out of the plot as I, as I was plotting it. It was not a trope that I started with. So I think it, it depends. I think when you're writing a category length novel, particularly um, using a trope, it makes it quite a bit easier. So you can kind of keep the plot very short and simple Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to when you're writing like a single title. Um, Since we're in this quarantine and just have some fun with it, even though it's terrible and weird and horrible, um, (laughs) what one trope other than close proximity do you think could come out of quarantine book? Mm. Surprise pregnancy. Yes, yes. <laughs> pregnancy. <laughs> <Teacher baby. laughs> uh, roommates. Roommates yeah. to lovers. Yeah, friends of lovers. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, enemies, enemies to lovers. True. I can think of a lot of like, like non romance tropes, like with the mystery people, dead body, who killed who? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody quarantining together. I, I, I think about like Bruce Willis, like quarantining with Demi Moore and his his older kids when he has a wife and younger kids. I'm like thinking maybe she's going to kill him after this is over because I have so many questions about that. I know. Just, like, there's so many weird stories, you know, um, medical, um, like a lot of medical um, right. yeah. tropes, yeah. like medical romance stories, mm. you know, like, like doctors falling in love, the patients, or maybe. Or uh, fake. What if uh, a doctor. what if like fake marriage? You're faking a marriage, and you're only supposed to do it for a week or something, and then the quarantine happens, and you're stuck with right. that person for you know, yeah. You fake it till you make it. at the time, yeah, or something like that. A ghost story, like a paranormal romance with a ghost in a house, and the people are in quarantine, so they can't escape it. Yes. Oh. <laughs> or um, like an epistolary romance where, you know, people meet on like Tinder or something, but they can't actually meet. So it's just like, you know, a long, like a slow burn that should have been a one night stand, but turns into like letters back and forth and texting and learning about each other. Quarantine yeah, cool. game show. <laughs> like a, something like, a, what was that show called? Love is Blind. Or now like... Mm. Some kind of movie producer says we can do people online and let's see how that works. <laughs> the quarantine chronicles. You could do a good um you could do a good paranormal yeah. ghost story with ghosts in the house and you can't leave. Yeah. Do you guys think that you'll I mean, this is a hard question and we need, do you guys think you'll incorporate the quarantine if you write contemporary? Like, will you, you know, the next sort of, no, you write, no I, I'm living it. Know. I don't want to write about it. I'm with you. I don't want to write about it. I, but I'm my, using it. My alpha holes. Like I'm, I'm writing a lot during the quarantine because I want to escape the reality of what's going on right now. Yeah, it, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I, I actually I, think, go ahead. I think that I will incorporate it, but not as a primary plot, but like as backstory. Like right now, I write a lot of military heroes who have backstory of having been overseas. And, but I also write first responders. And I think that there's a lot, like a few years from now, two years from now, there will be a lot of like backstories that come out of this in the same way that there are now a lot of 9 11 backstories. But you don't want to write about the immediacy of it, right? That, no. that, yeah. that makes sense. Like, like second chance romance is like, you know, somebody's spouse passed away and they met somebody else because of, a, you know, something right. that happened during this outbreak. 
And I love second chance romances. Yeah. Me too. That's more well, like a friends and lovers. That could be a friends of lovers too, because you know, you, your second chance is, you know, my best friend. I've always loved my best friend's wife. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, so I, I saw there was something on Twitter circulating about a month ago. So I want everybody to describe if you're in a relationship, a romantic relationship, what are the tropes from your own relationship? Hmm. Really? So my I'll start. Mine was enemies to lovers. Uh, yeah. So and a little bit of uh, second chance romance too, because yeah, there was a second chance going on too. But but I grew up with my husband. He was my younger brother's best friend from a young age. Oh, so for wow. a long time, that's a trope. Yeah, <laughs> you got I thought, I thought he was, uh, Yeah, I, I uh, it was definitely enemies to lovers, but now it's it's mostly lovers. <laughs> That reminds me of the entangled. Pub, I don't know. Are we allowed to mention publishers? Whatever. I just did. Uh, there, you know, there's this the idea that entangled. They want you to have at least three tropes in a book for it to be a success. And I feel yeah. like there you go. Like your romance is a success. Yeah, yeah. Three tropes are more. That's true. I like the secret uh, millionaire or secret billionaire too. I love yeah. those tropes. Yeah. Like you don't know yeah. that person's rich. Right. Well, I wish I, I wish that was my uh, romance. That'd be awesome. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> my room would be a bit bigger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my romance tropes are uh, friends to lovers and high school sweethearts. Aww. Aww. that's awesome. So how long have you been together? Um, we started dating when we were sixteen, and we celebrated our twentieth wedding anniversary last year. Oh, Aww. that's awesome! Congratulations. Congratulations. I want to make a joke about a shifter romance. Like my <laughs> husband is a is a griffin. <laughs> griffin. I'm, a, I'm a wolf. It, it wasn't going to work out, but we made it work. <laughs> I don't really have much of a trope. Like, I mean, I guess we're like we're an interracial couple, but that's not really, in my opinion, a trope. It's like more of a subgenre. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like we met online. So long distance lovers, well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Online, yeah. online meeting or long distance, yeah. Uh, long distance lovers, and uh, yeah. Now we're just trying not to kill each other. <laughs> I, think, I think we are all trying. <laughs> I feel that in my soul. <laughs> How can you love someone so much that you just want to strangle? That's why. <laughs> See, we're lucky that my husband has his office in the basement and I have my office upstairs. Oh, that's, so that works out well. It works out very well. We are very separated throughout the day. And then, you know, we come together at at dinner time and start doing, st you know, getting dinner ready and whatever. That's so perfect. I don't have to see him throughout the day if I don't want to. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> it is. That's key. That's key. So we're heading into our last five to seven minutes here. Uh, it's been an amazing conversation. Does anyone have um, any special messages for their readers or any giveaways that they want to share? I will be giving away a copy of Power Tool. Drink! Okay. Everybody take a drink! And, yes, an e-copy of Power Tool. Uh, so I'll probably post it on my Facebook if you want to join my group. It's uh, Elizabeth Lister's Kinky Clubhouse. I'll be in there. I'll probably put it on my main page as well and also on the RTC link. Excellent. Um, I'm giving away a copy of Forward Pass, which is a best friend's little sister's trope um, for everybody who joins my reader group and says that they join because of this. So go on Facebook, look for Desiree's Darlings, and join, and we've had a lot of new people join today. Yeah, nice. I'm doing uh, I'll be giving. Go ahead, Go ahead. Molly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so polite. <laughs> it's the Canadian thing. Um, I'll be giving away a uh, copy of my arranged marriage trope paranormal romance, um, the Griffin King's Consort, um, to anybody who joins my reader group, which is Jen Burke's Epic Adventures on Facebook. I'll post a link to that on the Romancing the Capital page and also on um, my author page. And uh, like Desiree, if when you join my reader group, just say that you've joined um, 
after watching this and I will send you that copy. I'm doing the same. If you join my reader group, it's uh, O'Keefe's Keepers. Um, and I'm giving away audio codes. I have, uh, I have two steamy romances and then one women's fiction. Um, let me know if you want US or UK and we'll, uh, we'll get you some entertainment to kill a day, hopefully. But stop by O'Keefe's Keepers. And um, if you join my readers group, I'll give away a copy of, since we're talking about hot alien abductions, I'll give away the first book in my um, series, my um, Alien Overlord series, um, His Acclaim. And uh, to say that you were um, listening to the Romance in the Capital um, live stream. And uh, mm -hmm. that's it. I'll give you, I'm giving away e-copies. <clears throat> yeah, same here. Um, so I have, I, I also have a Facebook reader group. Please join it. It's Zoe York's Wardham Ambassadors. Mm -hmm. But if you just search for Zoe York, it'll pop up. It's the reader group. Um, and I will, I will put a post in there for everybody with all of my marriage and trouble books uh, that, and, then I'll, and links um, to get them for free in different formats. So however you prefer, ebook or audio. Um, more information about that in my Facebook group. And also this book, oh, there's a glare. Personal Delivery is an undercover boss book. It's also a secret billionaire book just for Yvonne. Um, and it's free in ebook everywhere. So people who are watching this, you can grab a copy of this just like at all of the ebook retailers. Okay. Well, it was an absolute joy and pleasure. And thank you also to all the viewers who were commenting and having fun online today. I think we've made a, the best of a really bizarre situation. And I'm, for one, looking forward to, I know you also, you weren't going to write your quarantine um, fictions, but man, I really enjoyed that brainstorming session. So I do hope we get a few of those ideas out. Yeah, thank you so much. All thank right, you thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good chatting with all of you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see everybody again. All right, bye.